I think the state of global health is that all the money that has poured in over the last eight years, which has been a substantial increase over anything previous to that, um, has paid off. I'm Laurie Garrett, Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations. A decade ago, it would have been almost inconceivable that Mexico could have tracked down um, all the the various traces of H1N1 in rural parts of that country. And today it was done almost as if it were a matter of routine. Um, it, it, that is extraordinary. And we still have a long ways to go, but at least the money and the commitment has panned out to help us at this time. We don't have a global supply of vaccine. We don't have a global supply of Tamiflu adequate to meet the challenge or a distribution system. And then this sort of global solidarity could quickly fall apart and we would see rich countries getting the tools necessary to treat and poor countries not and real rage and anger and retribution actions akin to what Indonesia has been doing for the last three years, uh, you know, refusing to share samples of bird flu viruses on the grounds that uh, only the wealthy world would profit off of them and the vaccines would never be available to the poor. Well, for many years I've argued that the, the biggest, most important missing piece were rapid diagnostics. You know, even here in the United States, if you're sick and doctors aren't quite sure what's wrong with you and they order um, basic microbiology tests to see if you have staphylococcus or tuberculosis or what have you. For the most part, they're ordering uh, tests performed that haven't improved much at all in decades. The technology is pretty much the same darn crap we've been using to d determine whether you have strep or staph, you know, for since the 60s. Uh, and the irony is that if you go to the academic level or into the biotech industry, you see toolkits being used now based on DNA that are extraordinary, where they can, they can do things like diagnose previously unknown organisms that we don't, we don't even know what it might be, find it, identify it, put it in a class of viruses, and tell you that answer in a matter of hours. And yet, these tools are not getting put to use in any routine clinical settings, not in the United States, not in poor countries. Uh, and this is just an absurd problem. Now, the reason they haven't been put into use in places like the United States has to do with insurance reimbursement, with how hospitals structure their whole pathology departments, just stupid stuff that, um, you know, government or good corporate intervention could fix. Um, in poor countries, it's still about the cost and the specifications of the tests. Uh, you know, when you hear, for example, that our CDC has developed uh, a so-called rapid screening test for H1N1, well, yes and no. It's rapid in that it takes six hours instead of three days. Uh, but it has to be performed by skilled personnel inside of a laboratory with, you know, relatively sterile hygienic conditions and safe, safety precautions for the scientists that perform it. And it requires scientists. What we need down the road is something that's sort of the equivalent of a home pregnancy test. You know, if we could pee on a strip and tell you whether or not you're pregnant, we ought to be able to develop something, or the target should be something, where you can spit on a piece of paper or something very rapid um, that can be performed by a rank amateur, by uh, a paramedic, a community health worker um, that doesn't require a physician, doesn't require a trained scientist doesn't require a trained lab technician and certainly doesn't require a five million dollar laboratory in order to do those tests. And this gets really profound when you take something that's life or death like drug resistant tuberculosis. Right now we have strains of TB in circulation, especially in uh, hard hit 
HIV belts of Africa that are basically utterly incurable where they've mutated to such a degree that the antibiotics we usually throw at tuberculosis don't work. Um, and yet, because of the nature of our screening devices and our diagnostic toolkit and the costs, we are usually diagnosing these after the person's dead. We need much more rapid ways of assessing whether or not a child is infected with a drug-resistant form of malaria. We shouldn't be finding that out on a population basis, meaning you look at 5,000 kids who've been treated for malaria, 1,000 of them died, so I guess the drug doesn't work. That's not satisfactory. So we need a lot more technology dedicated to the pursuit of genuinely rapid diagnostics that are not affected by heat, that can be used in tropical, humid environments, um, that can be performed accurately by minimally trained individuals and that don't cost a lot. That's a tough toolkit. I actually am aware of uh, several prototypes of rapid screening devices based on DNA that cost about $50 a run, take mm, about three hours to complete, you don't have to stand there for three hours. You start the process, you walk away, you come back three hours later. Um, and they're capable of diagnosing, um, well, let's say you had a fever of 102 and some really dire symptoms. You couldn't stand up anymore. You were so weak and so on. And uh, we want to know what is infecting you. We're sure it's an infection, but what is it? Currently, at most American hospitals, the doctor would make a set of guesses and instruct the hospital lab to run this test, this test, this test, uh, you know, each one of which will be separately billed at some exorbitant amount of money. Um, but there are now screening devices available where a single blood drop or small, literally we don't need to put a syringe in you to pull out, that's another thing, we want to get rid of syringes because they spread disease. We can just take pin pinpricks from your finger, put that blood down little wells, and on those wells are plated uh, reverse DNA that will pick up conserved segments of genetic material that have to be present in each class of viruses. So I don't have to know, I don't have to guess that you might have Ebola. And I don't even have to guess about some unknown, previously unseen organism. But Ebola is part of the filovirus category. And this thing will have little bits of DNA on it that detect whether you have a filovirus. And it will come back and say, all right, it's this ca class of virus. It does not match a previously known form. And in three hours, the doctor knows whether we need to quarantine you, whether we have any drug that will work for you, whether we're just going to have to give you supportive care, lots of fluid, what the problem is. Similarly, there are rapid diagnostics that can screen for antibiotic resistance an antiviral resistance on a large scale. So, you know, you're basically saying, in theory, in the United States, right now, every hospital, every clinic could screen your, you know, mystery illness with one single test and come back with an answer that would inform the doctor's choice of treatment. And then a second test that would tell you whether the treatment you chose is going to work or whether the organism is a mutant that can resist that drug, right? None of this is being implemented. I always like to bring up Costa Rica because here's a poor country dependent on tourism as its primary economic engine with no key natural resources other than the beauty of the place, but no oil, nothing big commodities, and they have basically the same health indicators as the United States of America. They spend about 1% of what we do. Uh, they have far lower per capita earnings and spending for health, and yet they live as long. They have healthier children, skinnier children, and uh, just, you know, the same infant mortality rates and better rates of vaccination than we do of their children.
And it's because they made that social contract and decisions. And by the way, they don't end up ha having chosen universal health care uh, as a single payer model. What they end up having chosen is that the role and duty of the government is to the health of its children. And every child from pregnancy all the way through to age 20 has all their health needs taken care of by the state, which includes nutrition, exercise, vaccination, you name it. After age 20, the state is defined as responsible for primary care. But if you need triple bypass heart surgery, you're on your own. It's a cruel formula uh, that a poor country has to make. But you can buy health insurance to cover those uh, catastrophic needs like open heart surgery. Uh, and it works. It works.